So welcome to our pre-class video for today. Um, this is going to be continuing with our chemical kinetics, and today we're going to re really be trying to understand mechanisms and how they relate to, to reactions and rate laws. And then in class we'll talk about reaction coordinate diagrams, so we'll add that piece in there. And so in terms of what we should be understanding, we're really looking for the relationship between mechanisms and rate laws. So that's the main focus that we're going to be trying to pick up, as well as um, kind of a secondary piece of just being able to identify the different um, kinds of species and what they are. And so that'll hopefully be a relatively easy piece. Now, as we've been talking about kinetics, there's a couple of different things that we've hit so far. We've talked about the impact, like what kinds of things impact the rate of a reaction. We've talked about how quickly do uh, reactions actually occur. And then also, how do we know how much stuff is going to be later on? So how do we sort of make predictions about um, how reactions are moving and progressing? Now, today in class, we're going to add a couple other things. We're going to actually try to understand why do reactions have different rate laws. Um, and then we're, in order to do that, we really need to understand how does the step-by-step -step process by which a reaction happened actually impacts its rate. Um, and then in class, you guys will get to the last piece, which is really how do catalysts impact uh, reactions as well. So overall today, our goal is really to try to understand a reaction in terms of its mechanism, its rate law, and the reaction coordinate diagram. So pull all those pieces together. And so that's a little bit of new stuff that we'll bring in here. Now, as we talk about chemical mechanisms, um, we've touched on this before in class. Last semester, uh, when we talked about some of the organic stuff, we talked about mechanisms. And really what we sort of said is it's that step-by-step -step process by which reactants are converted to products. And we saw some examples of that, right? We would draw it out and we'd do the substitution at a carbonyl and we'd see that there are a couple steps with that process. Or when we did the addition of an alkene to bromine, we'd draw those out and we would see that there were, again, a couple of steps to that process. It wasn't just like, boom, it magically happened but there was a, a, a process by which happened. And so that is our mechanism. That's what we're talking about. Now, as we talk about mechanisms, there's a couple of uh, terminology pieces I wanna make sure we have there. So first of all, um, we sometimes talk about the elementary reaction steps. Those are the individual steps that we tend to draw out for the mechanism. And when we add up all those steps, it should be the same as the overall reaction. We also have intermediates. Now, these are species that get formed in the process of reaction, but then get used up. And again, we saw those a lot last semester that we'd make something and then just immediately use it. Um, when we talk about steps, we can talk about them in terms of being unimolecular, bimolecular, or termolecular. And that just depends on how many uh, different molecules are involved in that individual step, how many actually have to collide with each other. And because, you know, it's going to be harder to have more things collide simultaneously to all have one, and ha one thing happen at once, unimolecular and bimolecular are most common, termolecular less common, and you almost never see anything about that. Because to have four things all collide together at the right time with the right orientation and the right energy, like that's just asking for a lot to happen. So most things are, you know, one or two things reacting. Every once in a while you'll see three. And then we have catalysts, and those are species that are used in, in a reaction and then subsequently reformed in the mechanism. Okay, so again, the big idea here is that the rate laws can actually help us to determine which mechanisms are wrong. So if we consider this reaction that we have out here, right, we've got NO2 reacting with uh, carbon monoxide, and that's going to form nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. We can imagine a couple different ways this could happen, right? It could all happen in one step. Those two molecules collide, bing, bang, boom. The oxygen gets transferred from one molecule to the other, and we're done. But we could also imagine there might be a more complicated process where two nitrogens might actually have to react together first. Uh, sorry, two nitrogen dioxides would have to react together first um, to form a different compound that would then go on to eventually form our product. Um, so those are different possibilities. Now. If we look at this reaction, we might be wondering, oh, what's the overall rate of the reaction? Or what's the rate law? So let me give you just a few moments um, to, to think about this and try to come up with what the answer is. And um, again, you might want to pause the video for just a moment to do that. OK, hopefully you've had a chance to think about that just a little bit. And um, it turns out, in this case, we, we actually need a little bit more information to be able to determine that. We've told you in the past that rate laws have to be determined experimentally in some fashion. Um, it might be really tempting to kind of look at this first one and say, oh, cool, you know, things seem to line up, that looks great. Um, but again, we don't know that until we were able to do um, some sort of experiment to prove it. And so when it comes to actually determining the orders of reactants, right, we've got this generic rate law. The rate is going to be equal to K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B, and those are both raised to exponents. Um, and those orders actually have to be determined experimentally, as I just said. And we talked about a couple different ways to do it. One is that initial rates method, right? We do a whole bunch of experiments, and then we compare initial rates and how fast reactions start happening. 
Um, and so that works really well. And oh, you guys like it as students, it often works well, but there's a lot of work that kind of goes into that. Um, a different way to do it was the integrated rate laws, right, where we could do a single experiment um, and measure the concentration over time. And then what we would do is we do different graphs in order to see which order it fit best. And so that's kind of a process of elimination piece there. Now, there's sort of a third way to determine rate laws, and I want to be just a little bit cautious from this. Um, and in this case, we're actually going to determine rate laws from mechanistic steps. Now, that's different from determining the rate law for a reaction itself. Um, but if we have an elementary step that involves, you know, some molecules of A reacting with B to form some compound, and this was our RDS, that's our rate determining step, then what we could say is that the rate is going to be equal to K of A to the N and B to the M. Again, again, because usually we'd only have two or maybe at most three things that ever collide, um, likely N and M are going to be small numbers like one. So let's go back and let's revisit a reaction we previously talked about. In this case, it's the two molecules of NO2 reacting to form uh, two molecules of NO plus O2. And so we spent a bit of time on pre-class two um, talking about this one, right? And so what we did there is we graphed out our data and we figured out the order for this thing and we discovered this is our straight line. So our rate was going to be equal to K times the concentration of NO2 squared. So it's a second order reaction. So that's what we know. And that's our experimental piece. Now we might be wondering how might this actually happen, right? And so just like that previous uh, reaction we looked at, we could imagine there's a couple different ways that this could happen. One possibility is that one of these molecules of NO2 is going to fall apart, right? That for whatever reason, we get enough energy, um, an NO bond uh, breaks, and now we have a free oxygen atom. That free oxygen atom could then come and react with another molecule of NO2 um, to form NO and O2, right? And if we add those things up, um, we can then cancel out things that appear on both sides. Uh, in this case, that would be the oxygen. And we see that, cool, we end up with that exact same um, reaction. So this is a viable mechanism at the moment because it does actually explain how we would get those products. Now we could come up with a different way to be able to do this. So mechanism two in this case. In this case, we're gonna have two molecules of NO2 react. We're gonna get an NO that's immediately formed. And then we get this other um, species here, this OONO. So we've got, what that means is two oxygens are attached to each other and then attached to nitrogen to an oxygen, um, rather than NO3, right? Because if I wrote NO3, you'd think everything is attached to the nitrogen. So we wanna be a little bit careful there. So in this case, we add those things up and we figure out, okay, what can I cancel from both sides? Oh, this thing, this OONO disappears. And again, we have that same reaction. So this is a viable mechanism. It could potentially work. Okay, so let's consider these two mechanisms, right? We know the actual rate law, okay? But let's just take a moment and let's make sure that we understand some of the terminology that, so we're all on the same page. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video for a few moments and just identify if each of these species is a reactant, a product, an intermediate, or a catalyst and um, provide the answers on D2L uh, on the quiz there. And um, once you're done with that, restart the video. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to answer those and figure out what the different species are, just kind of get, make sure that we're comfortable with the language a little bit. Um, what you hopefully identified is that our NO2 is gonna be the only reactant here. NO and O2 are products. Again, you probably knew that, right? The things on the left side of the arrow are reactants, on the right are the products. Um, but in this case, the oxygen and the OONO are both intermediates. Because remember, we said an intermediate was something that got formed initially and then got used up later in the reaction. And that's what happens with both of these. Okay, so now let's um, try to tie this into rate laws just a little bit. So what we can now identify is we can actually identify the rate law for each of these individual steps. Okay, And so for this first one, the rate is going to be equal to K, because again, we always have a K, times the concentration of NO2 to the first. Because remember, for the rate law, when we're talking about an elementary step, we now can take the coefficient of this and use it as an exponent, okay? Again, that only works for our elementary steps. So what I want you to do is just take a few moments, now go through and write out the rate laws for those other three um, potential mechanistic steps. So what would you get for that? Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to do that and answer the questions on D2L. So now let's look at um, what those would be. So for this first one, we would get K times the concentration of O to the first, the concentration of NO2 to the first. Um, again, because both of these have a coefficient of one over here, this is an elementary step, so we can take those coefficients and move them into exponents. Uh, for mechanism two, we get the rate equals K times the concentration of NO2 squared. And for uh, down here, it's the rate equals K times the concentration of that OONO compound to the first. So cool, so overall, the rate of the reaction though is gonna be determined by the slowest step. And so we might start to ask, are there any um, of these possibilities that are consistent with the experimental rate law? 
So one thing I want to take a brief moment to talk about here is, again, the idea that um, the rate of the reaction is determined by the slowest step. And so I have this fun little image here of an hourglass, right? Because the rate at which the sand is going through is really determined by how fast can it get through the smallest aperture, right? That's the slowest place. How fast it can get through up a little bit higher, doesn't matter. How fast it can get through down below, doesn't really matter. It's always just that slowest step. If we narrowed it, it would slow down the rate. If you could open up that hole just a little bit, it would go through a little bit faster. And the same is true here. So again, it's the slowest step that's going to determine the rate of our reaction overall. And so we can look at this, and once we do that, we can now identify that this very first step of mechanism one couldn't possibly be the slow step, right? Because it's predicting that, well, we would have the concentration of NO2 to the first, and we know that that's not the case. So we can immediately say, well, mechanism one with that first step being the slow step doesn't make any sense. Okay. Now, for step two being the slow step, I'm not really sure, right? We've got this concentration of O that's not the same as the rate law here, but we don't really know what the concentration of O is. You know, maybe it's the same as the concentration of NO2. So maybe that works out perfectly fine. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, and the same happens down here, right? This clearly doesn't match our actual rate law. And so that seems a little suspicious, but we don't know what that's actually equals. Because the problem is these are intermediates. And we really want our rate laws to always be expressed in terms of reactants uh, as much as possible. And sometimes we'll get other things like catalysts or products that might be in there. So let's see if we can actually um, try to get rid of that. So let's look at the possibility of that second step being the slow step for mechanism one. If the second step is the slow step, right? So if the second step is the slow step, then we know that this has to be a rate law. But we actually want to get rid of that intermediate because we can't actually measure it. And so we want to put it in terms of something that we could actually measure. And so we need to do a little bit of um, chemical and mathematical um, manipulation to really see if we can get rid of that. Now, one thing that we can do in this process is it turns out that we know that the second step being slow means the first step has to be fast okay, relative to that. And what that means is it's going to actually have to be in equilibrium because most of the time that this NO2 would react to form NO and a free oxygen atom, the second step is slow step. So we've got plenty of opportunity for these guys to re-react and reform NO2. Okay? And so we can actually write this first step as an equilibrium. Okay? And that becomes important. Because in an equilibrium, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are going to be equal, because it turns out that's how we define equilibrium. We've talked about that a little bit in some other places. We'll talk about it more when we get to equilibrium, but um, let's, let's accept that at this point. So what that means is our forward rate has to be equal to the reverse rate. Well, you know how to write forward rates of reaction, right? So the rate is going to be equal to k times the concentration of this stuff. It's a single elementary step, so it's going to be to the first. But we could also write the rate of the reverse reaction, right, because that's just uh, NO and O reacting to form NO2. So we can do that. So that's going to be equal to K and I put R for the reverse um, process here, times the concentration of NO to and o times the concentration of O to the first. Well, these things are all equal, so we can do a little bit of simplification, put those two rates equal to each other. Now, if we look at this, I've got two constants and two things that I could actually measure and then my intermediate. So I can do a little mathematical rearrangement here. And now I can try to solve that expression just for my intermediate. Now, the reason that I want to do that is because I can now use this expression and do a substitution, right? So I can go back to my original rate law and I can substitute this in. So I can plug that in, okay? Now what we can do is we can actually do a little bit of simplification. So now we can say, oh, cool. So what we have is going to be the rate is going to be equal to a K. And I've combined all three of these Ks together. They're just constants. We don't know what any of them are. And so we just merge them all together. And then I've got this is going to be equal to the concentration of NO2 squared times the concentration of NO to the minus one. Okay, so now we see that we've, hey, we've got that NO2 squared. That's kind of what we were hoping we might see. But we have this other piece here, right? So we actually have um, the concentration of NO, one of our products that's now sneaking in here, um, but it has a negative exponent. Okay. And so when we look at this, what we see is that if that second step was the slow step, um, this uh, rate law got converted into this new rate law once we get rid of that intermediate. Okay, so this is actually what our expression of the rate law is. And it turns out our actual experimental rate law was the rate equals k times the concentration of NO2 um, squared, right? It's second order just in that. There is, is no NO to the negative one that's present. So what that tells us is that mechanism one actually isn't consistent with the experimental rate law at all. So it can't possibly be right. So we're actually able to eliminate that. Because what we saw is if step one was the slow step, it didn't work. If step two was the slow step, it didn't work.
Okay, so now what I want you to do is go through and do that process on your own. So what is the predicted rate law if the second step of mechanism two is actually the slow step? Okay, so here's mechanism two, here's our second step. We know what the rate law is, but again, we have this intermediate. So we wanna get rid of that. And remember, if the second step is the slow step, we've got that first step being the fast. So use that information and the rate laws, our rates of the forward and reverse reactions to now try to get rid of that. So take a few moments, pause the video and try to figure out what the answer to that question is. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to, to give the answer in D2L. Um, and so it turns out E is gonna be the right answer on this particular one. So let's just walk through and make sure that we can see how that happened. So again, if this second step is slow, we know this first step is gonna be fast, so we can say it's in equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, that means the forward and reverse reaction rates are gonna be equal to each other. So then we can write out our expression for the forward rate. So this is concentration of NO2 squared. Then we can write out the concentration or the rate for the reverse. So that's the K uh, of the reverse process times the concentration of OONO times the concentration of NO. We can set those two things equal. We then go through and we solve for that intermediate in terms of all the other things. We're then going to go back to our rate law for that slow step. And then we're gonna do that substitution and put that in there. We then wanna do a little bit of that simplification and just sort of write it out. Again, combine those Ks together, um, adjusted it so I've got that negative one exponent so it just looks a little bit more like how we normally stare at it. And so now we get our new rate law here if we remove that intermediate. So this is again, now measured in terms of reactants and products, things that we can actually measure. But again, we see this actually is not consistent with the experimental rate law, so this also can't be a slow step. And so in this case, what we see is if the first step was a slow step for mechanism one, this is what our rate law should be. If the second step was a slow step, this is what our rate law should be for the first step of mechanism two, for the second step of mechanism three. So when we look at this, knowing what the rate law is, what that means is the only mechanism and slow step that are, are consistent is mechanism two with the first step being slow. That's the only one out of these that's actually consistent. Now that doesn't say that that's right. It's really important here. So it's not that that's right. It's just that's the only one that's consistent. We know all the other ones are wrong. And when we do this sort of process, we can only prove mechanisms wrong. We can never actually prove them right. We'd have to do more work to do that. And so in this case, we would probably try to do something that would identify is this intermediate actually present? So we might try to add something that would react with it. And we could demonstrate, aha, look, this was present. Therefore, that, that's more evidence that this is probably the correct mechanism. So let's look at one more reaction for you guys to work on here. So T-butyl chloride will actually react in a basic solution. And it's believed that the mechanism is a two-step process that looks like this. So what I want you to do is go through and predict what is the rate law. Okay, here's a couple different options. So answer that in D2L and then the remaining ones. Um, and then you should be all set for class.